Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's presentation. My name is Mark Klopach Mathias, and I am here representing two of the organizations tonight, the sponsors, including Hope for Creation and the University of Wisconsin River Falls Office of Sustainability. Before I hand things over to Dr. Root, I would like to acknowledge the rest of the sponsors for tonight's presentation. So the full list of sponsors is the River Falls Public Library, our host for this series, the St. Croix River Association, Powerful Choices, the School District of River Falls, and then again, the Office of Sustainability at UW River Falls and the community group Hope for Creation. Thank you again to all of our sponsors for your hard work in our community and, for, and in the region for everything that you are doing to improve sustainability. If any of the viewers tonight would like to get in touch with any of those sponsors, please feel free to email sustainability at uwrf.edu and we can send you the contact information for any of those organizations. Many of them also have websites and Facebook pages if you do some Google searches. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce and to welcome back Dr. Terry Root, who kicked off this series back in October. Dr. Terry Root is a Senior Fellow Emerita in the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford University. Her research addresses how plants and animals are changing with the changing climate, including the examination of extinction risk of species. She was a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, Fourth Assessment Report, that in 2007 was co-awarded the Nobel Peace Prize with Vice President Al Gore. She was also a lead author for the Third Assessment Report in 2001 and a review editor for the Fifth Assessment Report in 2014. In addition to other honors, Root was awarded the Spirit of Defenders Award for Science by Defenders of Wildlife in 2010 and the Lifetime Achievement Award in 2016 for the conservation organization Point Blue. She has served on the boards and as a science advisor to several non-governmental organizations, including the National Audubon Board from 2010 to 2019. Currently, she is on the board for Defenders of Wildlife and American Wind and Wildlife Institute. Root earned her undergraduate degree in mathematics and statistics from the University of New Mexico, her master's degree in biology from the University of Colorado, and her doctorate in biology from Princeton University. She was a professor at the University of Michigan for 14 years until she moved to Stanford University where she was on the faculty for 15 years. She retired and moved to Sarasota, Florida in the summer of 2015. Thank you again, Dr. Root, for presenting tonight. We are thrilled to have you back and I now hand it over to you. Thank you, Mark, very, very much. I really appreciate uh, being here. Um, it's, it was so much fun giving my talk on, specifically on climate change that I really wanted to talk to you all about how wildlife and plastics, plastics is a big climate change issue, and I really wanted to talk to you about, about that too. So that's what we're gonna do today, is we're gonna talk about, I, I know it doesn't seem as though wildlife and plastics have anything to do with climate change, but I promise you'll see it as I go through the talk. But it's, so my title is Climate Change, Wildlife and Plastics, The Innocent Victims. And this is a very tough talk actually in a lot of ways because of the innocent victims. There are so many innocent victims like this, this stork that you can see here in this picture. It's having to live its life through a plastic bag. And thank heaven, it has its wings out so it can fly. It has its bill out so it can eat. But just think about what, what we have done to that poor individual having to subject it to that kind of, of life. And we are very much a plastic society and we need to start getting a handle on our plastics so that we really try to put a stop to it all. But let me talk about what I'm gonna talk about tonight in general. First, I wanna go about go through all the facts about plastic. Um, there are lots of facts, there are lots of big numbers, um, and we'll go through all of that. Then I'm gonna to go to the second part of the talk, which is a very tough part to watch because it's looking at these innocent victims, the wildlife that are being affected by the plastics. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna end up talking about what we all must do. And that's what's nice about this is that there's a lot of things that we can do and we all need to get together and do them. So now let's go ahead and talk about the facts about plastics. Well, the plastics was actually invented or created 
back by Leo Bake Bakeland in 1907. And he was surprised at what he found when he put some polymers together and came up with plastic. And he also invented um, foam rubber too, uh, about this same, this same time. Now, from 1907 until 2020, this is the global plastic production in millions of tons, millions of tons. So that starts in 1950 when it, it really was getting, getting going. Um, it took a while from 1907 to 1950 to make a lot of plastics, but from 1950 and you go on and you can see how incredibly large our, our population is in using plastics. Plastics are just used all the time. So in 2020, we used 435 million tons of plastics. And now people are, are projecting out that we will actually quadruple that number by 2050 to almost 1750 million tons of plastic globally. That's a lot of plastic. So now, um, since 1907, we have created about 9.2 billion, with a B, billion tons of plastics. That is a lot of plastics. Now I have trouble with with big numbers like that, I, I have trouble figuring out what they actually mean. So what I did was I converted that into the equivalent weight of Empire State Buildings. So 9.2 billion tons of plastic is equivalent in weight to 25,000 Empire State Buildings. Now of that 9.2 billion tons of plastic, seven million tons of it is now waste. That's a lot of waste out there. And how, how many Empire State Buildings is 7 billion tons? It's equivalent in weight to 19,000 Empire State Buildings. So that's a lot of waste that we have generated from our plastics. Now this is where the um, climate change issue comes in because it, we use about 6% of our oil and gas production to make plastic. So that's a lot of oil and gas. And what, what happens is for every single pound of plastic that we, that we make, we put six pounds of CO2 up into the environment. So this is a huge, huge, huge climate change issue. The scientists have told us that by 2050, we need to be at a net zero of CO2. We should not be putting out any CO2 into the atmosphere. We should not be doing that. Um, that is going to be a very, very hard thing to do because of the fact that we use so much plastics. So I told you before that we, the estimate is, is that we'll have 1,750 uh, tons of plastics by um, 2050, a uh, million tons, sorry. Um, where is all that CO2 going to go if it's not going to be emitted into the atmosphere? So plastics is an issue and we have really got to wean ourselves off of plastics. We really don't have a choice. We've got to do that. Now the EPA report has come out and said every single, every bit of plastic ever made is still in existence. Wow, that's pretty incredible. So of all the plastic that has ever been made, 12% has been incinerated, 9%, only 9% has been recycled. I bet all of us have been very religious recyclers 
but most people are not re religious recyclers and we are we only had 9% recycled 79% holy mackerel have of the plastic that has ever existed is now in landfills or in the ocean and that is because plastic does not disintegrate what plastic does is this it just breaks up into little tiny pieces all the time and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller into little tiny beads of microplastics and we'll talk a lot about my microplastics in a while so um incineration does get rid of it it does mean that there's an awful lot of toxins that go up into the atmosphere from the incineration but other than that that has been incinerated it is basically breaking up into little bitty tiny pieces now what do we have to do about all of this well there's a lot of things that we can do um, one thing is we need to be banning the use of plastic bags and there have been 10 states in the u.s that have banned plastic bags they include california connecticut delaware Hawaii, which makes sense since it's a, an island state, Maine, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington. Now, guess what? Wisconsin has banned the banning of plastic bags. So you cannot ban plastic bags in Wisconsin. But Wisconsin is not the only state that that has happened in. It's also happened in 17 other states. The state where I am, I happen to be in Florida right now. We have also banned the banning of plastic bags. And there was one city, Coral Gables, that took it all the way to the Florida Supreme Court to say they had the right to stop having plastic bags in their city. They lost. So here are all the states that have banned the banning of plastic bags. And if you look at that, you now can tell how strong the oil and gas lobby is in various states. It is very, 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 very strong. And we've got to start bucking that lobby and it's gonna be a hard thing to do. But as we learn how damaging plastic bags are, I think it will get easier and easier. Now, shoppers worldwide use about 500 billion single-use plastic bags every single year. Single-use plastic bags every single year. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of plastics. About a million plastic bags are used each minute worldwide. That's a lot of plastic bags, folks. We have to do something about this. Annually, about 150 plastic bags are used per person worldwide. Now, that's not as high as I had expected it to be um, because there are many, 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 million, many people who do not use plastic bags at all. So that's what's being taken into account here. Now, Ireland was <clears throat> put a 15 cent tax on plastic bags. That's all it was, was 15 cents. They taxed the plastic bags and it caused a 90% drop in plastic bags. So we know that we can do something about this. There are things we can do. We just have to do it. So Ireland has shown us the way we need to follow it. Now, plastic bags are not the only single use. The other, well, let's talk, sorry, let's talk, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk more about plastic bags. The average annual plastic bag usage in the U.S. per person, per person is 365. That's one bag a day per person. That's the average annual plastic bag usage. And given that many of us don't use very many plastic bags, that means that there's a whole slew of people in the US that do use a lot more plastic bags than just one a day. That's ridiculous. We really don't need to have that happen. Now let's compare that to the average annual plastic bag usage in Denmark per person. Now think about it. 
How many plastic bags do you think a person in Denmark uses? Just have that number in the back of your head. Let's see if you're right. Four. Four. That's all they use in an entire year is of plastic bags. That's all they use. Now, if Denmark can do it, that's a developed country. The U.S. can do it too. But the U.S. oil lobby is much, much stronger than the Denmark oil lobby. I promise you that. Now, the other types of, of uh, uses for single-use plastic bags is the making of plastic bottles. Oh, they're horrible. My husband and I went to Costco just the other day, and I just couldn't believe the number of bottles that people were putting onto their, their uh, shopping carts. I, I wanted to go up and shake them and say, don't do this, don't do this. Anyway, Americans purchased 346 plastic bottles per person in one year, 2015. That's almost one a day. Why? America has good water, except for in some cities like Flint. But in general, we have got good water. There is no reason why we need to be using plastic bottles like that. If you have to use plastic or bottled water, then get the big, huge bottles and put it in one of those, those containers and then take it out of that. You don't need to have individual use plastic bottles. You really don't. Now, let's talk about how many of those bottles are actually recycled. So each person in 2015 in America used 346 plastic bottles. Only 32 of those bottles were recycled, only 9%. Only 9%. That is really, really quite sad. So by far, the single-use plastic is by far, by far, by far, by far the worst. And that includes plastic bags, as we've talked about, plastic straws, we don't need to use plastic straws. When I was growing up, we had paper straws. That tells you I'm old. Yes, I am. But we don't need to use plastic straws, plastic bottles, and plastic wrap. We don't need to use any of those. We really don't. Then in addition to that, what we've found just recent, fairly recently, much more recently than um, what I'm talking about here, is we have to worry about microfibers. So this is a list of what is the worst and microfibers are the worst. And I will talk to you a little bit about microfibers in, in, in a little bit. Um, but microfibers come from polyester, nylon, all the um, human made uh, cloth that we, um, that we wear. And what happens is I'm sure everybody washes and dries their clothes and the dryer has a lint trap, right? Well, the washing machine doesn't have a lint trap, but the amount of lint, i.e. microfibers that are being put off in the water is more than your lint trap is actually trapping. So now if all of this throughout the United States is we're all washing our clothes and we're washing clothes that are made of polyester or nylon, um, those type of, of elements. Um, we're putting a lot of microfibers out into the water and those microfibers are getting everywhere and we'll talk about that in a minute. So now let's talk about what's going on into the oceans. About 8.8 .8 billion tons of plastic is being dumped into the ocean per year. Not physically dumped, but it's being blown into the ocean. It's, it's finding its way by get, getting caught in um, uh, storm drains, things like that. It's all going out into the ocean. 8.8 .8 million tons. Wow, that's a lot. So let's go back, let's go back to my, my Empire State Building example. So if we have 8.8 .8 million tons of plastic going into the ocean per year, let's assume 
that we have 8.8 .8 million tons of Lego bricks. My uh, stepson would be thrilled with that many Lego bricks. He is a Lego brick fanatic. What we could do with those Lego bricks is we could actually build 19 life-size Empire State Buildings and actually have some left over. So 19 life-size Empire State Buildings are dumped into the ocean every single year. No wonder we're having a plastic problem in the oceans. Now, the reason we're having a plastic problem in the oceans has to do with the currents of the oceans. And if you can, you can see the arrows going around and around, the North Pacific gyre is the strongest one. And that is the one that has the biggest, um, uh, the biggest um, trash pile of, of plastics in, in the ocean. But there are five different trash piles in the ocean. Um, it's just the North Pacific one is the biggest one. And what happens is once a piece of plastic gets inside those currents, it really doesn't get outside of those currents. So it stays inside and it's, it's tough. It's tough to get, to get rid of it. Now, something that we have to remember is plastic works like a sponge and plastic will take on to on board toxins. And here is a partial list of toxins that they have found in micro, microplastics. So all, I'm not going to read them all to you. They're horrible, horrible, horrible toxins. You don't, you know, DDT, dioxins, you don't want those kind of toxins inside of you. So you really, we really don't want, we don't want the plastics to be absorbing those toxins. That's not a good thing to do. And something that just came out about a month and a half ago is that we in the U.S., consume about one credit card's worth of plastic every week. You, me, everybody listening to this on average consumes about one credit card's worth of plastic a week. That's a lot of plastic that we are eating. And what they have found is they have found microplastics in livers and in kidneys and they have just started looking. And this is showing you the highlight of the microplastics. And now if those microplastics have those toxins in them, then you could be getting, you could be getting cancer from, the, from all of the microplastics that are getting into your body. And they've just done a brand new study looking at microplastics in infants and found that in North America, infants are exposed to about 1 million tons of 1 mil, sorry 1 million microplastic particles per day 1 million particles of microplastics per day are what north american infants are exposed to so you really should not heat um, if you have plastic bottles you should not heat the the formula in in those bottles heat it in a pan and put it in a bottle. It's better to have glass bottles than plastic bottles. And then this is a brand new, a brand new study. They looked at only 3% of six placentas. And in four of those six placentas where they only looked at 3%, they found microplastics. So as they do more and more work on all of this, I guarantee you they're going to find more. Now, they did a study on sea salt all across the U.S. And what they did was they, they took different sources of sea salt from all across the U.S. and examined them. And they wanted to find out how many of the samples actually had microplastics in them. <laughs> they didn't have to do any statistics because it was 100%. So what that tells you 
is if you are eating sea salt, you, I guarantee you, are also eating microplastics. Now, I gave a talk, oh, probably about eight months ago now, maybe nine months ago now, and a woman afterwards came up to me and she says, I don't believe you. I don't believe that my sea salt has microplastics in it. And I said, well, that's what the scientists had found is, is that they were in 100% of all the sea salts. I got an email from her about four days later and she had gone home and taken her sea salt, poured it in a bowl and put water in it. She wanted to see if there was microplastics in her sea salt. She was so sure there wasn't. She wrote me an email and said, Terry, I apologize. My sea salt had a lot of microplastics in it. So my advice to you, please don't eat sea salt. If you need to eat um, in interesting salt, eat the pink Himalayan salt. It doesn't have microplastics in it, but 100% of the sea salt does. So when you're eating chips that are salted with sea salt, you're salted with microplastics in addition. So you've got to be aware. The other thing you need to do is you need to think twice about eating filter feeders because they're filtering out those microfibers. So anything like oysters, clams, other filter feeders like sardines, they have microfibers inside of them. You eat them, they're inside of you. Microfibers and microplastics are found everywhere. In 2009, microfi microplastics were found in the Antarctic sea ice. 2020, microplastics were discovered near the summit of Mount Everest. So they blow around in the wind, they go through the, the water, the rivers into the, into the oceans, they are everywhere. And then add on top of that our pandemic. The pandemic has only made things worse. I'm sure all of you have gone out walking and seen used masks just thrown on the ground. They're horrible. It's horrible. People are just taking masks off and throwing them down. It's really not good. They're made out of plastics. So I love this comic. Free hammocks all over town. It's a miracle. <laughs> so we don't want that to happen. So if you're going to use disposable masks, please, 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 please put them in the right receptacle to throw them away. The other thing I want to do, I'm going to get ahead of myself a bit, is see how the, the ear um, band kind of makes a circle. Well, animals get stuck in those circles. So when you take your mask off and you're going to throw it away, please cut that circle, those, those two circles that go around your ear so they don't get around animals. And I'll show you that in a little bit. Another source of, of plastics is from fishing equipment that has either been lost or usually is just abandoned. 640,000 tons of this type of, of equipment, fishing equipment, is lost or abandoned annually. And it gets tied, the, the cetaceans get tied up in it. This poor whale, it's, it's all captured on its tail. Think how hard it is now having to carry that around all of its life because it doesn't have any way to get it off of itself. Now there is good news. This came out in September of 2020 saying that there's a super enzyme eating that eats plastic bottles six times faster. So there is hope in the future to break down the plastics. That's what we're, we're, we're fighting for now is breaking down plastics. But folks, it's happening so slowly that we really need to stop using plastics. And we can, we just have to do it. 
So now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about wildlife and plastics and how the plastic is actually affecting them. There are five types of marine animals that are affected the most by our plastics, sea turtles, seals and sea lions, seabirds, fish, and the cetaceans. And as, you, as this says, you can see the difference, but a turtle can't see the difference. Turtles eat jellyfish and plastic bags look like yummy, yummy, yummy jellyfish. 50% at least 50% of all sea turtles, all sea turtles have ingested plastics. That's a lot. 15% of the endangered loggerhead uh, sea turtle young are dying due to the ingestion of plastics. That's tough because this is an endangered species. It's just not going to make it if it has to deal with that too. This turtle was, it's a green turtle. Um, it actually was very lucky because there was a, a man who was taking photographs and he was diving and he saw this turtle and he was actually able to take a, a knife and cut it out and get it free so that it could get all it could do was go up to the surface and breathe and then go back down that's all it had the energy to do because it was so heavy so heavy but this turtle survived but many turtles don't here's a seal that is trapped and now you can see how it's gotten its head in one of these circles that I was talking about, these plastic circles. So here's the, this poor seal gonna have to live the rest of its life with this necklace and it doesn't want that kind of necklace. Seals love to play with things that are circular and this is what happens. They get them around their necks and then what happens is they grow and the circle doesn't grow and it causes chafing, it ma makes them bleed, they get infected, and they die. It's very, 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 very sad. But And all we have to do is whenever we have something that is in a circle that is plastic, just cut it so it's not in a circle, and then they won't get it around their necks. Easy peasy, we just have to do it, that's all. Now, it's estimated that 60% of all seabirds have eaten plastics. 98% of the albatrosses that have been studied have ingested plastics. This is a photograph taken of, an, of a young albatross, and it was taken by Chris Jordan. And Chris Jordan is a fabulous photographer and he, videographer, and he went to Midway Island to see the albatrosses. He didn't know about the plastic issue. And what he was greeted by were thousands and thousands of young, like this albatross and the one in the previous slide, their parents go out and find plastic and they don't realize it's plastic. They think it's food. They bring it back to the young, feed it to the young, and the young starve. So the number of young that the albatrosses on Midway Island are actually raising to be able to go out and fend for themselves is minuscule because Midway is near to the Pacific Gyre and they're feeding on the plastics that are floating on the top. They're feeding on it, and then they're feeding their young it, and the young are starving. So if you look at the abundance of albatross, on the x-axis is years, on the y-axis is abundance. The top graph is for wandering albatross. The bottom graph is gray-headed albatross. It could be any albatross at all. All of the albatross numbers look like this. They are plummeting in abundance. And I will bet that many of those albatross, I'm 67 years old, 
many of those albatross species will be extinct by the time I die, unless I'm hit by a semi truck tomorrow. It's very sad. And who's causing it? We are. We are causing that problem. So we need to be doing something about it. Now, let's talk a little bit about fish. 12,000 to 24,000 tons of plastic has been ingested by fish just in the North Pacific each year. Here's another example of one of these round pieces of plastic. It's a rubber band that has gotten around this fish, and now it has to spend the rest of its life with this rubber band around it. It can't get it off. It just can't. Two thirds of our fish stocks have plastic in them. Two thirds. My husband and I just had salmon tonight and as we were eating salmon, I was sitting there wondering how much plastic was in it. I love this cartoon. May I please have a plastic bag? Oh, sure, already inside. <laughs> oh, we don't want plastic inside our fish. So let's not have that happen. Don't ask for plastic bags. 100% of sperm whales that have been necropsy. Necropsy is just another word for autopsy. Autopsy is what we do to humans. Necropsy is what we do to other species. But 100% of the sperm whales that have been necropsied have plastic bags in their stomach. And about a year and a half ago, a sperm whale washed up in Scotland or Ireland, I don't remember which, and it had plastic bags in its stomach that weighed 220 pounds, carrying around a, a glop of plastic bags in their stomach that was 220 pounds. That's a lot of weight to be carrying around. And then the other thing is, is that those cetaceans get captured by these things. So do manatees um, here in Florida. Um, this is a picture, actually it's a very positive picture. Um, the Clearwater Aquarium, Clearwater Florida Aquarium have been studying the dolphins in Sarasota Bay, in the bay right outside of Tampa and Sarasota. And the dolphins have gotten acclimated to the people. And what this is, is the one that is in the foreground is a baby. The one that is to the left of that is its mother. And the mother knew the baby was in trouble because it was dragging behind it this buoy and it needed to get rid of it. So the mother brought the baby to the aquarium right to the, the to right to the brink of the aquarium people went out you can see the two red um buoys there that are on the uh, uh a netting they put the netting up to hold them in some people held the mom other people got the baby and got the baby disentangled and the baby was set free so again it's a it's a positive story things good things are happening but how many of, of these incidents are actually not being helped by humans because they, can't, they, they don't have the acclimation to the humans? It's a tough one. It's a real, real tough one. Now, species not just in the ocean are being affected by our, our plastic trash because there is trash on the land and in landfills. This is a coastal bird. This is a black uh, oyster catcher, and it has gotten its bill caught. And as soon as it got its bill caught, it meant that it couldn't, it, it can't, um, can't eat anymore. So it starved to death. And here's a red-eared slider turtle that got on one of those God awful, oh, they're horrible. Those beer can holders, the six six uh, plastic holder, they hold six cans in this plastic holder. If you ever have these, please cut every single one of those circles apart, even the tiny ones, because tiny turtles can get caught in the tinier ones. 
And this turtle, they cut it out and it was able to survive, but it's always going to live its life with this funny, funny shape. Now, um, mammals also are affected. We have big bottles and they put their heads in them and they can't get their heads back out. And now they're gonna starve. Here's an example of an India wolf. And it had been seen for many, actually many weeks. Um, and they didn't have the ability to, to dart it and put it down to be able to catch it and pull the bottle off its head. But by this time, when this picture was taken, it was so emaciated and so starving that there were six different um, uh, wardens, park wardens, that jumped it, literally jumped it, and held it down and pulled this thing off of its head. And it's also a positive story. This wolf then was able to go and feed. It wasn't so emaciated that it just died. It went out and fed, and it, it was able to survive. But again, how many of the ones that are actually affected by these plastics have those success stories? So I know this is, this is really depressing. So let's talk about now what we all must do. There was a 16 year old, he's a little bit older in this picture, Boyan Slot, who went scuba diving with his father during spring break near the Greek islands. And he was appalled that he actually saw more plastic debris than he saw species in the ocean. And he decided at 16, he had to do something about it. So this thing that he's holding in, the, in his hand, it's like a boom, and this is how it works. So you have a parachute anchor here, and it's holding this big boom, this big turquoise thing that's like this. And then that big boom actually captures the plastic inside of it. And then you go out with a, sh with a ship and get all of this plastic out and get it out of the ocean. And his first, um, his first attempt at this didn't work but his second did better and his third is doing very well now. So even a 16 year old can actually, do, can actually do a lot. Now, many of you are going to remember there was an ad in the 1970s, they called it the Crying Indian ad. It was a Native American that was paddling in a canoe up a river and he kept finding plastic bottles and plastic bags and all sorts of horrible things in the river. And then he pulls his canoe up on the shore and all that plastic is there in front of him. And he actually had a tear coming down his face. This was an ad that was telling us that we had to recycle. This was an ad that was being put together by the oil and gas companies trying to say there is absolutely nothing wrong with us making plastics. What is wrong is you not recycling them. But there has to be, there has to be a market for recycled plastics. And that market and recycled plastics has just plummeted. There's just not a market except for number two plastics now. And there's never been a market for styrofoam. There's nothing you can do with styrofoam. There's nothing you can do with, with plastic bags. So this was a, a lobbying ad that was trying to convince us that we were the ones that were at fault, not the oil companies, where in actuality, it was the oil companies at fault because they were making so many things that we don't need. So now, what, what can we do? What can we actually do now? Well, never, ever, ever, ever again use a plastic shopping bag. You don't have to. There are so many cloth bags that you can use those. If you have to use 
something that is a one-use bag, then use a paper bag. Please don't use shopping bags, uh, plastic shopping bags. The plastic bags that you put your fruits and vegetables in at the grocery store. This is a little harder, but what you can do is you can take yours back again, or you can go to a place like Trader Joe's. Um, I know you all don't have a Trader Joe's in your town, but there's one that's fairly close. They make their fruit and veggie produce bags out of um, a cornstarch that disintegrates, that's biodegradable. And that's what we want to be using. No plastic drinking bottles. There is no reason in the US to be using plastic drinking bottles. If you need to be using drinking bottle, if you need to be drinking water out of something, then use a reusable bottle. You can use that. You can do it. You can fill it up at the at the uh, um, water fountains or at your in the bathroom or wherever. There's all sorts of places you can do this. Now, if you're in Flint, Michigan, um, or a place like that, that may be different. But most of America doesn't have a problem with their water. Please don't use other types of plastic bottles either. So when you go to the store and you're gonna buy some orange juice, please buy it in a paper carton. You have a choice, buy it in a plastic bottle or a paper carton. Please buy it in a paper carton. The other thing is you don't need to use detergent bottles anymore. You don't need to use Tide like that in a bottle. There is a, a product called True Earth, and they have actually made the soap into sheets where you actually take the sheet and you tear it apart and you put that into your, into your um, washing machine. Or you can get things in a box. OxyClean, if you're going to use a, a, an enhancer, you can buy it in a box. You can do this. It is possible. So here is an example. This is what the True Earth looks like. It, that literally is a big envelope that 32, um, actually what is half of 32, so that's 15, 16, 16 sheets come in there and you just tear them in half and you put one sheet in per load and it works beautifully. If I have a load that is really dirty, I'll put two sheets in just like if before, I would put in a little bit more um, laundry detergent. You can do this. You can get it get it online. OxyClean, this one I actually get at um, Costco, but I was looking the other day at um, Kroger's, which is like Safeway. I don't know what, what your um, grocery store chain is, but they have boxes instead of in plastic bottles. You can do it. It may be a little bit more expensive. It's actually not, but you can do it. No straws. That is an easy one. We don't have to drink through a straw. If you have a condition that you have to drink through a straw, that's different, but most of us don't. So all we have to do is just remember, you sit down at a table once the pandemic is over and you just tell the waitress, please, no straws or no plastic straws. If you have paper straws, you can use those. No plastic wrap. You don't need to use plastic wrap anymore. It's easy. We can use silicone bags or dish covers or wax cloth. The silicone bags, that's the one that's on the, the left-hand side here. The, the, the brand is called Zip Top. I bought this one at um, Target. And I love it. It can go in the oven. It's silicone. It can go in the oven. It can go in the freezer. It can go in the microwave. It's fabulous. And it's easy to clean. It is open. It opens up very large. There's another brand that's called Stasher. I have that too. I have trouble with that because it doesn't open as wide. So it's harder to clean. I like, I personally like the zip top, but there's other different different things you can do. But there's also, you can use dish covers. 
and the dish cover, there's all sorts of different kinds. Um, the one up in the upper right hand corner is also made out of silicone. The, other, the ones that are on the left hand side are made out of cloth. I have both kinds. I happen to like the cloth better because the, the uh, silicone ones stick out too far. I really love the cloth ones. The other thing that I absolutely love is waxed material. And the wax material is fabulous. It is really wonderful. The only time it doesn't work is when it's cold. So if you have something in the refrigerator that has the wax covering over it, you take it out. You can't put the wax covering back on it right away <laughs> because it's too cold. So I pop it in the microwave and I nuke it for two or three seconds. That's all it takes. And then I can put it on. I can put it on the bowl again. So I love it. Um, if you go to Trader Joe's, they have wax cloth, um, but you can get wax cloth in, in many other different places. I got mine from a place called E-T-E-E, E-T-E-E, -E -E. and um, I, I love them. I love them very much. What else can we do? No styrofoam anything. Styrofoam is horrific for our environment. It does not break down. It really absorbs a lot of toxins. So don't use cups, plates, egg cartons, meat cartons, doggy bag containers. No styrofoam, period. And what do you do about this? You choose other options. There are other options out there for cups, plates, egg cartons. You can get egg, eggs sold in paper cartons. Please, please do that. Buy meat from places like Trader Joe's because their meat are, comes in containers that are recyclable. They're number two. Um, and when you go out to eat, remember to take, I know it's been a long time since we've been in the pandemic, but when you go out to eat, take your own containers and you can take them, your own con doggy bag containers. It took me forever to remember to do that. And I'm sure now that the pandemic's almost over and we're going to go out to eat again, I'm going to have to go through a learning curve again to remember to take my doggy bags with me um, in, in a bag when I go out to eat. But you can do it. You just have to remember to do it. Please don't use one use plastic sandwich bags. There's no reason to do that. You can wash them out when you have zip top bags. You can wash them out many, many times um, and use them a whole lot. Or you can have wax paper bags. They still make wax paper bags. Or you can use the resealable silicone bags. And those, again, those are absolutely fantastic. I love them. Um, now let's talk about microfibers a bit. Please don't use any microfiber dryer sheets. Those are very, very common and that's putting a lot of microfibers out into the environment. Um, you can use paper dryer sheets. Mrs. Myers um, has paper dryer sheets or you don't have to use a dryer sheet at all and just use the wool dryer balls and you can get those on the web. You can also get them at Trader Joe's. I know I, I sound like I have stock in Trader Joe's. I don't. I just think what they do is, is absolutely wonderful. The other thing is buy clothing and bedding that is made of cotton, linen, or hemp, not microfibers such as nylon, rayon, and polyester. The other thing is wash items only when they're needed. It's easy to do and just do it. And many people think, oh, you can't have wrinkles from linen and cotton. I want something that's permanent pressed and that means it needs to have polyester in it. Well, I have on a linen shirt that I washed and then what happened was I put it in the, the dryer for two minutes, three minutes, took it out, shook it and put it on a hanger and I happen to like wrinkles. Maybe that's because I'm getting older, but I don't know. But I, I like wrinkles and I think we need to be doing that. And then two, what we need to do is cut open any circular plastic items. And it's easy to do. You just have to remember to do it. And remember, remember your ear loops on your masks. 
So here's a poor, poor seal that has gotten a circle of plastic around its waist. And you can see where it's rubbing and it's bleeding right there by the fin. It's not long for this world. And it's really sad. The reason that that, that, that poor, poor seal is suffering is because of us. And that's not fair. That is not fair. There are things we can do. There are things we must do. There are things that we, we will all do to make life better for these poor, innocent victims. So with that, I want to thank you for listening. And here's my name, my phone number if you want to text me, or my email address. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much. At this time, we will open it back up to question and answer. So if anyone has a question that you would like asked, please just type it into the chat or the comment sections, and then we will feed those to Dr. Root. Um, I really appreciate, while we're waiting for, for some comments to come in, I really appreciated all the information you shared and how you laid it out. I feel like many of us have heard and seen snippets of that, but the way you laid it out, um, I feel like was particularly impactful. And I really appreciate the, not just here's what we need to do, but here are substitutions for that. I feel like that's a very practical thing um, that we can have our viewers walk away with. So I appreciate that. That's right. Well, I, I looked online to see how far away Trader Joe's was from you guys, and it is drivable, mm -hmm. but um, you have to make a tra track of it. You know. Yeah, there's one in Woodbury, which isn't too far. And, you know, quite a few people in River Falls commute to the cities and things and go by <laughs> Woodbury anyway. So That's there's right. definitely people running that way. So we have one question that has come in. It says, even if we stop using plastics tomorrow, how do we get the existing plastics out of the oceans? We don't. <laughs> I am sorry to say, but it is true. Um, it is very, 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 very difficult to get plastics out of the ocean. Um, you, the, the, you capture them on the top and you can get what's floating. That you can do. But there is so much more plastics that have actually gone down underneath the water and we would have to get scuba diving and, and figure out how to get leverage to be able to get that all that trash up onto a boat. And nobody's figured it out yet. Now, does that mean we don't ever be able to do it? I hope not. I hope someday somebody will figure out how to do it. But right now, I hate to tell you, but we can't really get the existing plastics out of the ocean. That's why it is so very important for us to stop putting, putting plastics in the ocean. So thanks, Anne-Marie. Can you talk more about why people who don't care should? Why people who don't care should? Oh, well, you know, this is hard for me. I'm a biologist. And the reason I got into the field of biology, I, I actually work in, in how, why, how plants and animals are affected by climate change. And the reason I did that was because I actually care so much about animals. And I feel as though it is not fair for one species to be causing the trauma for somebody, for the, all the other species. Um, how do you convince somebody? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I honestly don't know. If, if they do not have empathy for other beings, I'm not sure what you do in that situation. But what I would do and what I do do is I... I call on their empathy for those for those other beings, like the the next to the last slide that I showed you of the young seal that had the the ring around it and it was bleeding. To me, that just that just breaks my heart, and I want people to understand that that's important. So that's the I'm I'm not answering your question. That's the only way I know how to answer it, though. Well, and one thing I feel like you're doing is you're educating people on the issue. I think. You know, a lot of people just, they maybe know about it on some level, but the level of detail that you shared tonight, I would hope would really encourage people to change. I look at the pictures of um, 
of the sea turtles with the, the pop rings or the beer rings around them. I feel like 25 years ago, I was being told as a little kid to cut those apart. So here we are so many years later and that's still an yes. issue and that's that's frustrating. But I think um, I think what we end up having to do is just really educate people and, and like you said, play to their empathy. Play to their empathy. There has to be empathy in there somewhere. So we have several people thanking you for the presentation. And I just have um, a couple questions that I'd like to ask as well. So one of them is you mentioned that Wisconsin has a ban against plastic bans. Um, so I assume that is a, that's a statewide ban. Does that prevent individual communities from doing city ordinances and things as well? Yes, it does. It's just like Florida's ban. Mm -hmm. We have, we have a, a ban in Florida and it was actually tested. It was tested by the city of Coral Gables to try and see if they could themselves say, no, we do not want plastic bags in our city. And um, it, has, it, it, it proved that, that the state ban is strong enough to withstand those, those challenges. Um, and if, if people don't believe that the oil and gas lobby is strong, all you have to do is look at how many states have banned the banning of plastic bags. There is no reason, no reason to ban the banning of plastic bags other than for the money <laughs> that the oil company is gonna get by making all of those plastic bags. Sure. So it's sad. That is very depressing. It is depressing, yeah. Um, my next question for you is, you mentioned that uh, plastic bags, there's no end market for those and things, but we see stores like Walmart and Target and grocery stores that are collecting those plastic bags. And I know there's companies out there that, um, you know, recycle it into like deck boards or, you know, patio furniture or other things like that. I'm wondering if you have any context on the efficacy of those programs, if in the process of, you know, recycling it or converting it into other products releases more toxins or, or any perspective on that. Okay, basically right now, the only, the only group of recycled plastic that is being used is number two, number two recycled. And that's the things that are going into decking and into chairs. Um, I actually have bought my husband, he loves to wear t-shirts and they actually put plastic, plastic into the t-shirts and it's now made the t-shirts so soft that's what he wants me to buy him all the time. Is a, these plastic bottle T-shirts? They are. They're wonderful. They're they're really great. But the 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 big bins that are at your grocery store saying, "Bring us your plastic bags and we'll recycle them." Guess what? They're all going to the landfill. All the styrofoam going to the landfill. It's just making you feel good. That's it. That's all it is. Now, my cousin's wife told me about a program in Kansas where they got together and got all of the plastic bags and they would strip them up apart and they made them into yarn. I know that sounds funny, but you, they would tie it together and make big long strands of the yarn. And then they crocheted bedding, bed mats for homeless people which I thought was really clever. But then the, the, the charismatic person who was doing this moved and it stopped. So there, there are things that you can do, but not, not a whole bunch. So it's, it's right now, Sarasota used to have a two stream recycle. So all the plastics went in one and all the paper went in one. Now everything goes in and everything is actually going to the landfills now, even number two. So if you hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we will get a better market for recycled plastics, but it's not there now. It's just not there. So you've got to stop using plastics because you know, I, I have a lot of people who say, oh, I'm not worried. I take my plastic bags back to, to Kroger's and put it in their bag. And I said, it's going right in the landfill. Yeah. So I actually do have a few of those T-shirts that are made out of plastic bottles and they are comfortable. 
So. They really are, and they're really <laughs> soft. <laughs> I thought they'd be scratchy, right. but they're not. Uh, mine all have sustainability quotes on them, so they're about recycling or things, but there's one that has a picture of a windmill and it says renewable energy. I'm a big fan. So. <laughs> Clever. Right. We have one question uh, back to the, the ban on bans. And the question is, does the ban on bans preclude communities from taxing plastic bags? So in the yeah. states where there are the ban on bans, could that be implemented? That's a, that's a very good question. I think it depends upon the state, and I honestly don't know. In, in Florida, I do know, and it does ban the taxing of plastic bags also, but I don't know about Wisconsin. That's a really, really good uh, question to ask your legislators and see if, if there's some way to get around it. Because Ireland was able to tax plastic bags and they really made a big difference. So, you know, you may not even have to ban them, but if you can tax them, that would work too. Yeah, that's a good, good, good question. Yeah. I have several interns that work in the Office of Sustainability on campus, and I feel like I have a whole list of projects for them to do some additional research on some of this. So Good, good. There are ads on TV saying that the American beverage industry has come up with recyclable plastic bottles. Is this real? I don't know. I, I haven't seen those. I mean, recyclable plastic bottles is just a... I, I'm not sure what it, what's being asked here. If um, if it's a number two, if it if it's a number two or a number three or a number four, normally you can recycle them. Uh, according to my my city, I can recycle anything from one to five, um, and I religiously put my recycles in the recycling bin. But it they are going. I I know for a fact they are going into the landfills. So um, I'm not sure. I, I, they may be recyclable, but if there's not a market for them, it's not going to happen. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think we will wrap up there. Um, we've gone a little over, and I appreciate you taking the time to field some of those questions. Um, again, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I feel like it was so informative and gave us good um, some things that we will be depressed about, but then also things that give us hope and that things that we can take action on. Yeah. Um, before we depart, I would like to highlight the next event in the climate change series. The next event is May 11th and will highlight conservationist and climate change advocate Tia Nelson. This was the event that was supposed to be in March, but we had to postpone due to the passing of Tia's mother. So that will now be on May 11th. And again, if you have any questions about the climate change series or would like to get in touch with any of our sponsors, feel free to email sustainability at uwrf.edu and we will get you the information you would like. So that is it for tonight. Thank you again to Dr. Root and for all of our viewers. We are very thankful that you could join us tonight. So, Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>